Hello and welcome to CWU Community Partnership Session. Our first presentation is Reeser Creek Aquatic Plants by Dylan Elm and Tomasa Tate. Welcome. Check, check. So my name is Dylan Alm, and Tomasa Tate could not be here today, um, but this is my part. I'm Allison Savage. And we are students from Ellensburg High School. So for a brief introduction, um, Reeser Creek is located on the west side of Ellensburg. Um, it is home to many different species of plants and animals, but when we specifically look at plants, we can see that there are both native and invasive species present. Um, the, purpose, or the purpose of our research is to determine and compare the amounts of invasive versus native aquatic plant species present in the restored Reeser Creek floodplain area. Here's a little visual representation um, of the floodplain area. So some variables um, for our controlled variable, uh, we chose the area to measure the plants in and kept it the same throughout our en entire experience. Um, our independent variable, we measured the plant species percentages at three different locations along the creek. For our relevant variable, uh, we measured our plant species on three different days, um, one in the fall in October, and then two times in the spring in May. And then our dependent variable was seeing how much of both native and invasive species um, and what their prevalence were in the creek. So our materials, uh, we used fishing waders, a tape measure, sample bags, Sharpies, uh, poles, and a GoPro. Um, so prior to going to the data collection site, we determined three random numbers to take, or steps to take uh, from the stream bank into the river. Uh, we did this in order to basically not have cargo cult science um, and say, oh, here's, here's a good spot. Let's just do this. That way we kept it random and, you know, not up to us. Um, we got to the area where we were collecting our data and then flipped a coin to decide whether we would start on the upstream or the downstream section. Um, the coin landed on tails, which was our downstream, and we walked to the end of the stream. After that, um, once we got to the correct area, we took the appropriate number of steps from the bank and found the coordinates that we were at. We pinned them and then we put them in our data document so we could use them later in a map. Um, we then marked a meter by meter square area um, in the stream with poles and began collecting samples of the plants that we saw in that area. Um, we then estimated the percent of the meter by meter area that was being taken up by these plants and then repeated steps four and five in a midstream and an upstream section of the creek. So here's a map of the Reeser Creek. Um, up top, we have uh, our upstream section, our midstream section, and then on the bottom, our downstream section. Okay, and then these are our amounts of plants that we found in the different areas. We collected in both fall and spring, and these are the plants we found in the downstream section, midstream and upstream, and then the same for spring. These are some images of the plants that we found in the downstream area. There's pondweed, duckweed, algae, and reed canary grass, which is invasive and is going to come up a lot in the next sentence. And this is midstream with widgeon grass and reed canary grass again. And then for upstream, there's widgeon grass, reed canary grass again, and then pondweed. And for, for spring downstream, there's reed canary grass again, more algae, which is normal, and more pondweed. And then for midstream, we have more reed canary grass again, and yellow iris, which is also invasive, and some more widgeon grass, which is normal. And then for the upstream for spring, we have reed canary grass 
and a brush plant that we found, which are both invasive in the area. And then for this one, these are the graphs that represent the invasive and native populations in the downstream location in fall and spring. And you can tell by the, both the data uh, graphs that in spring, there was a lot more invasive than native. And then for midstream, you can see that the same trend occurred again with a lot more invasive being there. And then for this one, there is an extreme difference in the invasive and native populations there from fall to spring. And then these are the overall numbers from all sections of during fall and during spring. And you can see again that there's a large increase in invasive and native in these ones. So it just shows the big change in difference between the two. And then these are our data charts with Shannon's index and species richness. And Shannon's index is a calculation used to determine species diversity or species evenness, which is the, diff the levelness in relativity to each other of the different types of species in the area. So this side is the species or Shannon's index scale, and this is the species richness. You can see those two with the different colors in all three different locations in the next. And this one, you can see that both Shannon's index and species richness declined during the spring. So in, uh, in conclusion, um, we found that there were more invasive than native plants in the areas that we found in the spring compared to the fall. Uh, we also found that reed canary grass was present in every single stream section that we located, both in the fall and the spring. And the ecosystems during the spring had lower species richness and species diversity than the fall, which would make the spring ecosystems more susceptible to having issues with recovery, especially from things like natural disasters. So some possible means for errors. Um, we could be possibly misidentifying these plants. Um, there's always a possible or a possibility for human error on that part. Um, having an incorrect approximation of the amount of plant types in the area, um, since it's a rough estimate of what we are finding in this one meter by one meter area of the creek. Um, not collecting all types of plants in the area. Again, since it's such a small area that we are collecting our data from, it wouldn't show all of the plants that are possibly in the creek and in surrounding areas. And then uh, this is our first time measuring and identifying aquatic plants. So bear with us. So why is this important? Um, the increase in invasive plants during the fall uh, is not good for Risa Creek habitat uh, because less native plants means a reduction in the number of organisms that are naturally occurring in the area. Um, since invasive plants spread and grow more rapidly than native ones, an increase in them would cause for a large decrease in these open ecosystems, and they could be taken over by invasive plants. Uh, we recommend research groups to further examine uh, reed canary grass specifically. Um, this plant species is highly invasive and was prevalent in every single section of the river that we measured. Um, this plant became especially abundant in the spring, resulting in much of the area becoming suffocated. Um, we predict that this species could be dangerous for many native plant species located in and around the creek. And here are our sources. Any questions? <laughs> Thank you so much. Questions? While you were identifying the different plant species, how many species in general did you identify? Like the a different amount of species in each location. Each location had about three or four different types of species, but later in the spring, those two sections 
or two sections had three and one had only two. So they got like lower the different types of or species that we found there. Any other questions? Hi, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I realize this is probably a little bit beyond the scope of your data, but uh, why do you think there were so many more invasive species in spring than fall? Do you think that's generally a feature of spring or do you think it shows a trend where there's increased invasive species in the area overall? Um, I, there were no other um, projects on the invasive and native plants there, but I think that there's probably always more invasive plants there, but when we collected in fall, more of the invasive ones had died by then and there were more native. And then once it became spring and the conditions were better, all the invasive ones grew back. And so that's where there are more invasive. So that's what I think there's probably always more invasive. More questions? If you guys were to redo your experiment from the beginning to the end, was there anything that you guys would have changed? Like in your procedure, in your data collection, anything? Um, off the bat, I think <laughs> maybe doing our research on the same days um, since we were coming back in the spring on separate days because not everybody in our group was able to come on one day. Um, I think getting all the data together would be beneficial and having more people there to you know, collect data. Maybe like having a better understanding of the native and invasive plants there before doing the um, research because in the beginning I didn't know like any invasive or native ones like off the top of my head so it was like all completely new all of the plants I had never really heard of any of the plants um, so yeah I didn't really know about any of them before the research so probably doing that thank you any more questions Uh, considering how uh, the invasive, you know, plants plant species have a tendency to die off during the fall season, do you think they might eventually adapt to this to the current environment? Let's say, like in the next thousand years or so, would they be considered native at that point or still invasive if they've adapted to the weather in question or the environment in question? Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I guess, I don't know how to format that. I guess it depends on uh, what those plants are still doing in the area. Um, if they're still suffocating other native plant species, then maybe they could be considered still invasive or just dangerous to the local area, um, even though they're abundant throughout you know, generations. Allie, do you have anything to add? I don't really know, like, what makes them invasive or native, but I guess if they were there for, like, 100 years and they were more resilient during the, the fall and they were there year long, then I suppose they would be um, called native, but I don't know. So, yeah, maybe they would be all native if they Okay, thank you very much. Let's thank our presenters with a round of applause. Great job, you guys. And the next presenters are Reeser Creek Cross Sections. Nathaniel Larangel, Lydia Blaisdell, Ashley Callan, Brandon Miller, and Carol Ritzenhaller. Come on up, you guys. If I mangled anybody's names, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Just kidding.
Am I good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Lydia Blaisdell. Ashley Cowan. Brandon Miller. Carol Ritzenthaler. We are from Ellensburg High School, and today we'll be talking about um, the successfulness of the um, Lisa Creek Restoration Project in relation to cross sections. So a little introduction, our purpose of this research project was to find and understand the natural, natural dimensions of Lisa Creek. We collected data on several different days. Um, we collected data in 2021 on October 20th and 27th, November 10th and 24th, December 8th, and then this year we collected data on May 12th. Um, our goal was to identify channel stability and channel beds and to measure deposition, erosion, and sedimentation. We also used data from 2011 and 2013. We used the same procedures in order to remain consistent with their experiment, um, and we wanted to determine the change over time. Our overall hypothesis for this project was um, that Lisa Creek cross-sectional data will have measurably changed since the previous year's measurements. So you may be wondering, why do we need to know what, about cross-sections? It's mainly for the aquatic e ecosystems and riparian zones and how the, how the sedimentation from the new floodplain is affecting those ecosystems and the biodiversity, as well as the nutrients that gets added with the soil and this can also further impact the spawning habitat for fish because in some areas it may be more muddy or it may be more rocky and this influences a lot of the spawning and also the flow rate of the water. It also was very significant around the housing and the change in no more flooding to just change in our channel beds. All right, so for the variables of our experiment, for independent, we have the time and location of measurements. For our dependent variables, we have the stream cross sections at the three sites. And for the control, we have tools and the procedures of our experiment. And our materials, uh, we had a metric measuring tape, a survey pole, and a stadium pole, which we borrowed from the college, and some iPhone compasses. Uh, some notebook, pen, and paper, and some waiters we borrowed from our school's vice principal. So just for visual representation of Rooster Creek, um, we collected data at these three points on the map, the upstream, midstream, and downstream locations. We located these using the GPS coordinates used in the past year's experiments to keep the data consistent. Um, also, it's important to note that this is a, a satellite photo from around 2011, I think, so it looks a lot different. Um, so it was very important that we use these GPS coordinates because we would not be able to accurately identify because the landscape is so different now. Um, as you can see in those two photos, um, it is there's way more vegetation than there was in 2011, so that is um, just stressing the importance of the GPS coordinates. Um, in our procedures, we started by locating the upstream locations using the GPS. And then once we had found the locations, that rock is actually one of the locations. Um, we then set up the stadium pole on the east side of the bank and rolled across the river um, our measuring tape. Then um, we used the, sur uh, the survey pole to measure every 0.25 meters along the, the width of the creek. And we reported this data back to our recorder and then the recorder repeated it back to the person taking the measurements so that we made sure that we were in the right spots and that we were getting an accurate read for our data. After we finished all the way down um, the width of, our, of the creek, we then accounted for our materials and packed up. We then um, located um, the downstream and midstream locations and repeated all of uh, our procedures at these locations. Okay, so here is the data for the upstream site. 
um, on our vertical axis, we just have the depth. And on the horizontal axis, you can just see it's a lateral measurement. Um, 2021 is in blue, 2011 in red, and 2013 in yellow. And the upstream location followed our hypothesis the closest. As you can see in 2011 in the red, it was very uniform. It looked very kind of man-made. And uh, by 2013, the deposition had built up significantly and 2021 followed the 2013 trend very closely, which was pretty cool to see. And you can see that reflected in the overall area. Uh, the midstream site, uh, showed the most change overall. Um, you can see how in 2011 and 2013, they kind of remained pretty consistent, but by 2021, uh, there was a significant increase in sedimentation. And again, you can see that reflected in the area. Uh, we found that our downstream site was the most consistent across all the years, and we think that's because that's the boggiest area. That's the part where you found the procedure, one of the pictures, like it's up to our waist. And it's just very boggy, and so the sedimentation kind of remained very consistent, and yeah. So some of our sources of error was in our graph for the midstream, there was a hole that was removed by the 2013 group for unknown reasons, but our data was also shifted to match up our zeros. So it could have had a potential error because we shifted the zero so we could more closely see the relation between the years. We also had to repeat the downstream section and that's why we had to do it in the spring was because there was extreme weather when we decided to do the downstream section. And then also going across, there's a lot of more vegetation and more wildlife and trees. So we couldn't always measure 13 meters. So we had to cut it down to say like 10 meters just because there are physical barriers. Ah, so in conclusion, we found a consistent trend across all three sites we measured. Uh, the reduction in width of the stream from bank to bank, as well as a reduction in the depth of the river from bank to lowest point. This is indicative of high amounts of sedimentation, which can originate from weather, agricultural activity, erosion, and more. Thank you so much for your time. Any questions? Questions? Comments? Yes. How does the erosion affect the animals that live in and near the stream? Excellent question. Yeah, so um, the erosion and the deposition that happens in the stream that was reflected in our data affects the animals in the stream because, um, like Ashley mentioned, with the um, uh, spawning habitats, um, depending on the mud or like if it's a mud consistency versus a rock consistency, then that will affect um, the spawning habitats. Also, um, the um, deposition, which is the like basically the sediment is being left and creating that like narrower uh, canal that is going to leave um, nutrients, which is going to be very beneficial for all of the plant habitats, which is why we are able to see such a like increase in all of the plant vegetation. Um, and overall, just like seeing more nutrients added to the creek. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Other questions from the audience? Um, I was just curious if you all could comment on changes that occurred between the 2011, 2013 data to more recently. Um, like, cause you mentioned, one of you mentioned it being more man-made before and now we're seeing the sedimentation. So what's kind of changed to allow some of that to happen? Um, just kind of the natural changes of the creek over time. It's a significant, that's like 10 years of changes we see. And so uh, the creek, I think there was, when it was first put in, it was kind of put in very like, they had a certain number of curves and everything. And just over time, as it floods and as it changes naturally, the shape and form of the channel beds just change. So I think time probably, <laughs> yeah. 
I also I also want to say I think that the addition of the um, floodplain probably also affected the cross sectional data. I think especially we see that in the last set of our data um, because it wasn't as like there wasn't as much deposition in that set of data. I think that that's probably due to the installation of the floodplain. Thank you. Oh, I see another question. How did you guys get into doing this? Um, I kind of just was like, hey, who wants to do a project with me? And then we were looking at previous years to see what was interesting. And I was like, hey, it'd be really interesting to see how this has changed over the years, especially with the project that happened at Research Creek. So I kind of just got these people together. Brandon didn't have much of a choice. We told him he was going to join our group. So it was a lot of just what looked interesting. And I didn't know a lot about cross-section. So I myself was personally interested in seeing what a cross-section was and how it affected it. So my own personal interest really led me to do it. I also think looking at the past year's data when we were picking our group members and like what we were going to work on, I think it was very interesting to us the the method of data collection that's used in the cross section, um, like being able to get the hands on like in the creek experience was just really appealing to us. So that that's why I think I chose it. But yeah. <laughs> do you, do either of you? Thank you so much. One last question. No? All right. Let's thank our wonderful presenters. We have about three minutes before 1.30 mark, so we will just wait in case people want to see this presentation.
All right, it's 1.30 on the mark. Welcome back uh, from the three-minute break. Um, it is my pleasure to present the next panel, uh, Reeser Creek Insects, presented by Himiko Amos, Kelly Duong, and Willow Logan, but it looks like it's just Himiko this time. Welcome. Um. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Kelly Jung, and I worked on this project with Will Logan and Himiko Amos, but they tested positive for COVID this morning. So that's why I'm by myself right now. And so for our project, we researched the bug population at Reeser Creek. And so why are insects important? Well, they are key in environmental processes such as pollination, sanitization, and removal of pests. And also the factor that that's applicable to our project is that the insect population is indicative of the ecosystem's overall health. We did our research in Reeser Creek, which is owned by the city of Ellensburg and was worked by the Mid-Columbia Fisheries. Our main goal for this project was to find out about the Reeser Creek bug population and if um, landscape had a play in insect species diversity. Our hypothesis was that the river area would have a wider range in insect species diversity, which meant higher productivity and a more valuable diverse habitat. And this could support a larger community. And in order to collect our data, we used three sweep nets that the entomology department were kind enough to lend to us, a camera, a Ziploc bag, Oh, many Ziploc bags to store the material we collected until it can be sorted out. And then we use 70% ethanol to preserve the insects and clear vials and a microscope to identify the species. And the oh, never mind. And the following variables were carefully controlled was the amount of time spent sweeping, methods of insect capturing, and uh, the vicinity of each of our trios of sweep sites. And the independent variables was location of the data collection sites near the river, the ground, and trees alternating. And our independent, var our dependent variable was the amount of diversity of insects captured. And so here are the three location plots that we tested at. Each of these plots were tested three times at the river, ground, trees, and totaling at nine. Plot one was downstream, plot two was midstream, and plot three was upstream. And this is a simplified version of our procedure. We used the three marked nature trails and determined the spots and recorded them on the GPS. And we took out sweep nets and timed for one minute. And we transferred the bugs, collected them in a Ziploc bag with the same plot number and area. And then once we were done with that, they were transferred into vials containing 70% ethanol with the same label. Uh, afterwards, we analyzed and recorded the sample size and species of the bug population with Dr. Irwin and cal calculated the bug diversity using Shannon's index. Um, so this is the simplified insect guide, so that it will help out with the data later on. Um, aphidoidea, which is also considered called aphids. These are soft bodied insects with sucking mouth parts. And chironomidae, which are non-biting midges that are highly diverse family of flies. And Phyllidae, which are leaf insects, and they're flat green bugs with a leaf-like appearance. And Arania, which are spiders, and they're eight-legged insects with a body divided into two parts. And so this is our data for the river plots. Um, we found that insect rich richness and vegetation structures are positively correlated. The riparian zone, which is also known as the area near the river, supported large amounts of vegetation that in turn supported many different species of insects. And that's just more of it. Uh, you can see that the top three were aphids and spiders and midges. And then for the ground, 
Uh, our top three were midges with 30.8% and leaf insects with 26.2% and spiders with 14%. That's just the graph again. Um, and then tree area yielded the least amount of results over top three. Oh, and our top three was um, Chironomidae and Arania and Aphidoidea. And so in conclusion, aphids were the most common insects in ecosystems near rivers. Midges were most common insects in ecosystems near ground and tree areas. And um, midges were overall the most common bug in all areas being very common among all three ecosystems. And so uh, Ropali siphum nymphaea, uh, these are aphids that act as pests in fall and found on leaves near bodies of water. Oftentimes are, that's where they're often found. And midges can be found in very diverse habitats, but are commonly found in rivers, lakes, ponds, saltwater marshes, and et cetera. And their adaptability to their environment account for their high numbers in all areas. And spiders are very adaptable and attracted to moist areas, but uh, also prefer dry areas. They can range from desert to water and everywhere except for polar regions. And um, the main question of our research was to find out insect species diversity. And overall, the highest species diversity was near rivers, then ground, then trees. However, it should be noted that due to inexperience in insect capturing, we were unable to properly catch many bugs in tree, tree section of plot one, which skewed our data. And then here's further explanation. Um, insect richness and vegetation structures are positively correlated. The riparian zone near the river supported large amounts of vegetation that in turn supported many species of insects. And that's just a quote, uh, fluctuating temps during the winter can have major effects on insect populations. For example, if there's unusually warm weather during, weather during February, it may confuse the overwintering insects. The warmer weather may mistakenly trigger them to emerge from their protected location. Once out, the returning freezing weather will kill the exposed insects. And then some problems that occurred was in spring 2022, we were unable to catch many bugs and we suspect, suspected this was because of the recent snowfall and cold weather, which made it difficult for them to revive themselves. And then for plot one trees, uh, we had improper sweeping, which limited our data. And another issue was that during the early capturing procedure, some insects could have possibly eaten each other, so this messed with our data. And that's work cited. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you for representing your colleagues. Questions? What kind of things do the bugs that live, or the bugs that you researched to eat? What do the bugs eat? Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking uh, they eat each other and, <laughs> and like uh, the leaves and that area as well. Vegetation, yeah. That area. Other questions? So I know you mentioned there were challenges in the tree plot doing sweeping. Are there different sweeping procedures for a tree area than a grass area? Uh, no, for all of them, we just kind of swing in the area. But uh, when my friend collected it, she was kind of just swinging at air and not the deeper parts of the tree.
Do you have a favorite rug you collected? Yes, that was the question on my mind too. Um, the spiders were really interesting to look at. I think it was on that one. They're very interesting. You can see like all the hairs and um, and a lot of the the vials that we were looking at. A lot of them were just kind of missing chunks, and it was just it was really fun trying to figure out what they were. <laughs> Other questions? You mentioned near the end of your presentation that you think uh, some of the bugs ate other bugs. Did you observe that or, or why, what makes you suspect that your bugs were eating some of the other, their friends in the sample? Um, so we weren't, able to look at our bugs because they're all moving around. So we put them in a freezer to kill them off, but it took two weeks. And the data by then was probably a lot smaller because they were still moving around by this, like the first week. And so we suspected that would have happened. More questions? Any other questions about bugs? Bug on my pen? No. I have no knowledge of bugs. We have to ask Kelly. <laughs> Any more questions for this wonderful presentation? Well, let's thank our wonderful presenter. And we have about four minutes until the next presenters can start.
All right, welcome back to the exciting panel on Risa Creek plants, insects, and sediment, and other things. Our next presenters are Risa Creek photo documentation by Chase Paris and Daniel Quinn. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Quinn. This is Chase Perez. We're from Ellensburg High School with the AP Environmental Science class. Next slide. All right. Now, some background on Research Creek, if you didn't know, uh, due to flooding in the area, in 2011, it was completely like remodeled and rest restored, and the entire shape of the creek was changed. And uh, so the first, so this uh, presentation, this whole, our whole data is based on presentation or based on data from the uh, previous Research Creek projects who did the exact same exact same uh, project as we're doing now. So this is built off of their data mainly. Uh, yeah. Next slide. All right. So we went into this um, experiment with the question, how has the Risa Creek floodplain changed over time? It's a very general question. And we sought to answer it by photo documenting the area. We didn't really know exactly what we were looking for, but we figured if we took pictures, we'd be able to um, see, see visual changes at least. And like Chase mentioned, this experiment has been done in previous years, 2011, 2012, 2017, and now with us. And we were able to get some interesting conclusions from this. Next slide. So for our procedure, we took the data from the past, uh, pres the past uh, data collectors, and luckily for us, they marked down all their data points, exact the GPS locations, and uh, named them nicely. So we took that those uh, GPS locations and went to the exact spots. We took a camera and we took a picture. Uh, facing across the stream, uh, one, another picture facing downstream, another pi picture facing upstream, then we went to the next spot and repeated it. Next slide. All right. These are our locations. We had 12 locations along the creek that the previous group had marked out that we tried to follow. Um, due to obstacles in our way, which we'll talk about later, we did add some new data points that could be re repeated in the future that are a little more accessible. Um, now we'll take you to our uh, Google Earth presentation where we'll show you some of our uh, uh, photos. In a, this is a better way to visualize where we took our um, photos at. Um, could we enlarge that picture, please? All right, so this is our most southern photo uh, looking up at the creek. This picture was taken in 2011. Um, next. Uh, this picture was 2017. And then our next photo, this was the picture we took. So see some clear differences already. Exit that. Next point. Up here's a picture we took from the levee. Um, give it a second there. Um, this gives a good view of the um, Southern floodplain area that's developed into more of a wetland um, from when it was originally developed. We have this and then um, next, that's in 2012. You can see the um, introduced vegetation there about planted next and then this is this spring um yeah next um this area um uh, we it was harder to collect data points here because a lot of it's underwater now um but we were able to line up one of our photos this is a uh, 2011 next picture. Um, 
2012 or 2013. And then next, this is 2017. You can already see the wetland developing there um, as it gets even swampier. And then next, um, this is a picture we took from the levee because we couldn't go down there to line up as best as possible. Um, on these next ones, we might not look directly at the pictures, but we can get an overview of, this is not all of our points, but we put down some of our um, best pictures to show how the creek has changed. Um, this one points up north. Uh, at each location, we took a picture facing south, west, and north to get a good view from each point what was going on. Um, next uh, point. Um, this is up north. This is the, the furthest north point that the previous groups had done. Uh, let's look at that image. See the creek there. Um, next, just note the amount of uh, vegetation covering the water. We'll talk about that later. Uh, next point. Again, we have one facing south and then one facing uh, north. We can go next point. And then let's go further to point 14. This was a new, this is an addition we added because these points were more accessible. And let's look at that. Yeah. See the striking difference from no vegetation to all of this vegetation. Let's go back to our presentation. Back to the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Now, this is just a, some of the same points as you saw earlier in the Google Earth presentation, just side by side. So we'll get through this pretty quickly. You can just see the Levy one, just 2011 compared to today, or just a couple, like a less than a month ago, actually. It's just very grown along with one across. Twelve across, you can see by the little bit of water in the right right hand side. That's yeah. And then this is eight up. Okay, so collecting his data didn't come without its challenges. Um, we had some of our the previous. Points were inaccessible this year because of vegetation. There are lots of willow trees that blocked our path to the creek and blocked any photos that could be taken. Uh, our data was kind of limited because of this. We weren't able to get the full um, scale. Um, and it was kind of hard to line up photos with previous years because of this. Um, but we did add new points for future experiments so they could be able to um, be able to reach more accessible areas. Next slide. This is just uh, one picture, but it it uh, relates to like many of the spots. These were the willows that were grown quite tall right along the creek, which blocked us from being able to get to the spots in addition to uh water block us not being able to get through the water to the creek uh and this happened from locations two through ten about okay. um so from from our photos we were able to derive that um the riparian zones in research creek have made massive recovery since the um creation of the creek, I guess. The um, creek is much more shaded, which is greatly beneficial to the aquatic um, organisms there. 
um, fish and that type, they need cooler temperatures. So there's definitely more of that. And vegetation has grown to be more diverse in different areas. The southern part of the creek has much different swampier plants than the north part of the creek, which is seeing uh, larger willow trees. And they introduced plants that the project put in have grown and propagated and have succeeded. And just an outlook for the future, this project that just as we have built on from the past groups that did, the future groups that take AP environmental science at the high school can build off of our, our, uh, our data with the new points easier to access. And there are many more conclusions that can uh, be found, as well as the other experiments, they are able to see, they are able to add to their, pres their own presentations, like the areas that were, that uh, they can see the areas that they took their data from our data and from the past uh, when Reeser Creek was first being built. Thank you. Thank you so much, the wonderful presenters. Questions? According to how you saw things are different now than they were before, how do you think things will look in the future? I think, um, especially with the willow trees, they're small and um, grouped together right now. We'll definitely, as they get larger, they thin out and we'll probably see lots of different, um, as the ecological succession in the area continues from the complete bare ground to what it is now, I think we'll see larger, um, larger plant organisms develop that shade the area more. Anything to add? Right. Thank you. Other questions? So you said the shading of the water was helping things. Uh, you increase the richness of the diversity in the population there. What does shade do to benefit those critters and creatures? So increased water shading um, decreases the temperature of the water, especially during the summertime, reducing that sun and especially um, salmon populations. Um, really, the salmon, which are in Reeser Creek, uh, benefit a lot from that. Um, we're seeing like in the um, Columbia River around Tri-Cities area, the water temperature is very high and that's been um, adversely affecting the salmon there. And so providing a good habitat here is helping the fish a lot more as they like the colder temperatures. Thank you. More questions? Um, I like that you're creating this database that will be so useful for future years. I'm wondering about all the, the sites, I think it's, well, five through 10 and maybe two and four that you didn't manage to do this year. And like, do you think that those sites should be, just leave them out because they're hard to get to, or is there another way to try to document those sites that you would recommend? Um, like I mentioned before with the willow trees, um, as they mature, they thin out. We're hoping that in the future, right now that the dense willow trees might block the area, but we're hoping that in the future, as they mature and thin out, those areas might become accessible again. And then maybe we could eventually see those um, data points get documented again. Thank you so much. Our presenters, give them a round of applause. And the next panel is ready to go.
for right now. Yes. It's yes. What do we have for time? Oh, perfectly on time. Wonderful. We are on track. So thank you to Boha, our wonderful moderator, for the one to two o'clock. I'll be your moderator for two o'clock to three to two thirty. So our presenters for this section are presenting on composition of creek sediment through farmland, Kittitas County. And we have Catherine, Holly, and Wyatt. I'm gonna turn it over. Um, like she said, I'm Catherine, this is Holly, and this is Wyatt. And we did our research on the composition of creek sediment through farmland in Kittitas County. And um, the purpose of the, oh, yeah. okay, thanks. Okay, the purpose of this um, experiment was to figure out the element composition of stream sediment heads versus mouths, which doesn't make sense. So um, what it means is that like the downstream versus the upstream, so like the top and the bottom and like compare which one has more sediment. Um, the ecosystem and agricultural runoff is um, part of that too. Oh, okay. Uh, and our hypothesis is <laughs> the elemental composition will correlate with distant stream travels through farmland, higher com concentration miles of stream. Um, so that just means that, like, we think that the as the creek, the like creeks run off, um, the the sediments will decrease, and then our independent variables are the stream location, and um, then like where we got our samples, and then the dependent variable is the elements that we found, and our control was how we sampled our data. And then these are the locations that we um, got our data from. Um, so for our procedure and materials, um, we used um, a collection and analysis prep by labeling our bags and planning out a driving route to go to all the streams for our collection. And then we collected using the same procedure at each stream where we put our hand in the outside of the plastic bag, turned it outside, and then grabbed a handful of sediment. And then we brought those back to the school and we transferred them into beakers, which we rinsed with distilled water um, to keep from any contamination from occurring. And then we dried them in the oven. And um, after that, we transferred them to new plastic bags and we labeled them. And then we analyzed them in centrals um, inductively coupled plasma optical emission spectrometry or ICP OES. Um, and our procedure for this is as follows. We rinse the tools that we were using with distilled water again to keep any contamination from occurring. And then we sifted the samples to remove any um, large pieces that were left. And we diluted them um, slash dissolved them in distilled water and then filtered them using a syringe. And we added um, some acid to them to help them dissolve further before they were analyzed. And then we ran them through the ICP OES. All right. Um, so next, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about our data. This experiment was very, very data heavy. And when we ran them through the ICP OES, we measured 46 elements, which is a lot when you have six streams and then two samples from every stream, that's a lot of elements. And however, a lot of those were below our detection levels. So we were able to sort those out. And then we ended up with around, we ended up with a significantly smaller amount of elements that were measurable and important to our experiment. We ended up with sodium, manganese, magnesium, potassium, iron, calcium, and aluminum, which are the elements you see up there. This is a bar graph of all of our data, which is a little hard to interpret. So later, I'm going to break that down a little bit more to tell you exactly how that correlates to our experiment. And as well, we were replicating an experiment. You can go to the next slide. This is the 2017 data. 
we replicated an experiment done in 2017 following the same purpose. And we were able to use their data to get a little bit more of a view on whether or not we had any errors in our data and as well just to get a little more data so we can be sure of our conclusion in the end. And then next slide. So in this first graph, we break it down into a few different spots. We label them for each of our creeks. You can see, and then on the x-axis, we're gonna have each of the distances that they traveled in kilometers. So we can see Courier Creek um, traveled right around 3.8 kilometers. And then Robinson and Nanum traveled really similar distances between our spots that we measured being around 4.8. And then Menash has traveled quite a bit farther around uh, nine kilometers. Then Reeser is significantly farther than the rest being almost 20 kilometers sitting around uh, 17. And so when you're looking at it, you can see in blue, we have our data, which is the, which is the change in calcium. So we took was we measured our calcium, at the bottom at our downstream location, then at our upstream location, we subtracted them from each other to get the difference. Then we would know as it flowed, did we lose calcium or did we gain calcium? And so that's what you're looking at. And the red dots are gonna be your 2017 change in calcium. So at Courier, we had a negative change in both years. So as it flowed, it lost calcium as it traveled, which is interesting. And then as we move on, Robinson and Nanum, in both years in 2017 for Robinson, for Nanum, in Nanum, they were swapped. So in 2017, there was a positive change. So it gained calcium as it flows. And then in 2021, we found that it actually lost calcium. And then Robinson in 2017 gained. And then we found that's our Robinson point up above. And we believe since it's not anywhere close to the rest of our data that we see, we believe that may have been an error in our procedure as we were gathering. We found some issues straining and that may have caused there to be a significantly higher concentration of calcium in that sample. Menashtash, we have swapped both years again. There was a very small positive change in 2021, then a negative change in 2017. And then in Risa, they found a negative change. And we also found a negative change that's similar to Robinson. We found that we believe that maybe an error set, because as you can see, it is significantly lower and unprecedented in how much that it lost. And so we believe that may be an issue in the concentration when we sampled it. And so moving a little bit farther, this time you can see the same graph, but this time instead of calcium, we were measuring potassium. And so on this graph in 2021 for Courier, you can see there was a very slight positive change. And in 2017, they measured a significant negative change in calcium. And then in Nanum, in 2017 for both Nanum and Robinson, there was positive changes. Then for Nanum and our 2020 experiment, we found a negative change and then a positive change for Robinson. That again is possibly due to an error because that is significantly higher than the rest of our data. Menashe as well, 2021 was a positive, and then in 2017 was negative, and then Reeser was two negatives as well. And then this is our last graph with sodium. And in sodium, we were able to find that in Courier Creek, in both years, we found a negative change. In Nanum, both years were a negative change. For Robinson, both years were a positive change. And for Menashe in 2021, we had a positive change. And then in 2017, there was a negative change. And for Reeser, both years was a negative change. But that 2021 point is probably an error because it is significantly lower than the rest of our data. Um, so for our conclusion, we didn't find a significant amount of correlation in any of our data. However, we did find a common trend that elements were generally higher concentrated in the tops of streams versus the bottoms, um, although there were multiple exceptions between the streams. Um, there were many potential errors in our data collection. Um, as far as when we collected data, um, we collected on several different days. One was after a significantly large rainstorm, which may have changed the flow of the streams and the sediment we were able to collect, as well as how we collected the sediment, because a lot of streams had rocky bottoms and we weren't able to collect sediment from them. We had to go closer to the bank, which um, kind of throws off our data. Also, um, our actual procedure in the lab at Central, because um, when we were filtering the um, samples, some of them didn't filter very well. And so more elements or more um, soil than we wanted to got into the final sample to be measured, um, which caused um, likely a very much um, higher reading than what we got in our other samples. And then those are the common elements that we measured in the highest concentrations. 
And then a special thank you to Central Washington University Professor Carrie Gotzi for um, her assistance in the geochemistry lab. Thank you. Are there any questions for our presenters? What's the farthest out you had to drive to the like locations? That one. Um, the farthest I had to drive was for Reeser. For Reeser, we had to drive all the way uh, up almost 18 kilometers from where we first started. So it was around a 12 or 15 minute drive. As well, we had to drive up into Robinson Canyon, which was very interesting because it was very icy up there. So it was, the driving was, a uh, challenge sometimes, but yeah. Um, yeah, I guess um, what Wyatt is referring to is that we kind of got stuck at one of our locations. Um, Katie's truck was stuck on the ice, so it took us a solid 20 minutes to get out of there, so that was kind of fun. Um, and then the other place that he talked about, we did see some dead carcasses, which wasn't very interesting. I mean, very nice, but um, yeah, I blame it all on Wyatt, anyway. Oh my, the treacherous of research, okay. So as far as um, the stream distances go, was it like as the crow flies or was it accounting for like bends and everything? Okay. Um, yeah, it was just, we took the straight distance and then measured it exactly from one point to the next. So it wasn't like the actual stream length, it was the distance from the top to the bottom. Um, I, I, that's cool. I like your data. It's really interesting. I don't think you should just throw out the data just because it looks different. It might be real. Um, one thing that can happen is if you have a, a water sample and you just, it gets diluted by like rainwater or meltwater, then it can get, become less concentrated, you know, so maybe if upstream you have some water coming down, right, and it's got a certain amount of stuff in it, and then rainwater that's got less in it comes in, that would be a way that you'd get higher concentrations upstream and lower concentrations downstream. And so I guess I wanna ask what you think about that. Is that a possibility? Cause like say for research, it looked like everything was all the same even though it's really weird number. Yeah, I think that's definitely a possibility especially considering that some of our data was before a large rainstorm and then after. So I'm guessing that that was very likely that that did occur. That's a very likely explanation for our data trends. Yeah, in the future, I'd really love to see this experiment repeated because there's so many different things that can happen with the stream, with the rainstorm or in the sampling. And I feel like our data shows that there was, it's hard to determine a direct correlation between the distance that it traveled. But as you mentioned, since it did try, like research traveled a very far distance, there's a chance that it rained upstream and then that changed in. That was something that we, we were definitely thinking about when interpreting our data. That's a very good point. I think we have time for one more question. Anyone has more? Any online? We're good? Okay. All right, thank you. Ready? Okay. Um, our final presentation for today is stream velocity and flow categorization in restored Reeser Creek. And our presenters are Lucy Altman Co., Bella Esty, and Regan Messner. My apologies if I.
My name is Isabella Esty. I'm Lucy Altman Co. And I'm Reagan Mesner. And we did research on stream velocity and flow categorization in the Restored Research Creek. And we're also from Ellensburg High School. Um, so just a little bit of background on the Research Creek restoration. We've all kind of been overgoing look going over the results of this restoration. Um, Research Creek does have headwaters on Table Mountain and it empties into the Yakima River before then flowing into the Columbia. So the subject of the restoration is create a more ecosystem friendly stream for many of the species that live in and around Research Creek. Previously, it was a very straight levee streamlined to create more housing area, which um, didn't work. It made a lot of flooding, but the restoration did create a floodplain. The Mid-Columbia Fisheries Enhancement Group worked on it and created a floodplain and completed the restoration in 2011. Then they were able to accommodate snowmelt and prevent flooding in West Ellensburg. EHS environmental science classes have studied this project ever since then on a yearly basis. Research Creek is the home to many organisms and species, three being the coho salmon, chinook salmon, and the steelhead trout. Optimal spawning for coho uh, is around 0 0.25 meters per second. Coho spawn and rear in the Research Creek area. Chinook uh, tend to spawn in the Yakima River, and then they come up as juveniles to rear in the Research Creek area, and they prefer rearing anywhere from 0 0.07 meters per second to 1.037 meters per second. Still had trout rear and spawned, and they are also an endangered species inside the Research Creek area. They prefer velocities from 0 0.3 meters per second to 1.1 meters per second. So this is just a little bit of an overview of an our experiment. So our hypothesis was that the stream velocity was going to be higher in the upper stream and then lower in the lower stream, and also that the average velocity would be lower in 2021 than in 2014. So our experiment, we measured the stream velocity at 20 different points along Research Creek, and then we also categorized the flow types at every location that we measured. So our procedure kind of had two parts to it. In the classroom, we calibrated our LabQuest devices that we used, and we also familiarized ourselves with things like the stadium rod, which we used for measurement in our vernier um, flow rate monitor. And then once in the field, we started measurements downstream at about 50 meter increments. Um, because of the vegetation, it often became difficult for us to reach certain locations, and which is really good for shade and ecosystem health, but not good for trying to get regular measurements. Um, so once Reagan was in the creek, she would measure the depth in the middle of the stream and then also report the flow rate back to Bella. Um, and then we kind of classified the flow type as a riffle, a run, or a pool. A riffle being that choppier stream movement, often a little faster. A run being kind of stereotypical stream movement, sort of that meandering flow a little slower and pool being a pool being nearly stagnant water that's more conducive to things that require not as much movement. And then we also recorded coordinates so we could see how our locations corresponded with the experiment that we are going off of from 2014. During our data collection, uh, we were able to reach 20 points in the stream and record velocity as recorded on our map. We encountered some challenges while doing this that uh, resulted in kind of our skewed look of where we collected. The willow reeds that were mentioned earlier by another group were a huge issue when it comes to accessing the stream due to heavy vegetation. Another issue was the salmon reds marked along the stream. These coho reds we avoided, avoided at all costs and gave 50 meters on each side of the red marking before we continued to measure our data. Another issue we encountered was the safety of access. Uh, some of the areas we just simply couldn't get to without risking injury or other issues. And as you can see in the pictures up here, we have some heavy vegetated areas at the top that are very densely vegetated. And then we have some of the shallower areas that were easier to reach. And then there's Bella with the lab quest that we were using to measure our data. Okay, so this is um, our data. So over here on the vertical axis, you can see this is the number of measurements. 
And then this uh, horizontal axis down here is our flow rate. So we compared data from 2014 um, and the fall of 2021, which is data that we collected. So we were able to collect 20 data points along the stream. In 2014, they were able to collect 30 data points. So as you can see, in 2014, their data was skewed fairly largely. They had data all the way ranging from zero meters per second all the way up to 1.5 plus meters per second, which is a fairly quick um, velocity. Um, in 2021, our data was in a fairly concise area, but all of our data points were within the range that is ideal for salmon rearing and spawning. So this is another graph similar to the one that we just looked at, but because the number of data points that we collected was not the same as in 2014, we just wanted to show you guys um, those same flow rates, but in percentages so you guys could get a better idea of how those um, data points compared. So in 2014, you can see that they still were pretty skewed. And then in 2021, we had a fairly large um, percent of our data right here in this 0 0.26 to 0 0.75 range. And that range um, for velocity is ideal for, like Reagan mentioned earlier, coho um, spawning and rearing. And like Lucy mentioned earlier, we also uh, classified the stream um, at every point that we measured. So we categorize them as either a pool, a riffle, or a run. Um, and over here on the left side, you can see this is the number of locations that we categorized. Um, the majority of our data was taken as a run, which is what Lucy mentioned, just that standard stream flow, um, an average velocity of around 2.5. Um, and then, we had one pool, which the velocity of that was zero meters per second. Um, and it's really encouraging to see that this data spread was pretty um, spread and that the stream classifications were all varied. And it's encouraging to see this because different species need different types of habitats. Sorry. Uh, okay, so we just want to talk about um, what could have skewed our data. So according to the theory of helical flow in a meandering stream, uh, the average velocity is not always the highest in the middle of the stream. So at every point that we, take, we took data, we measured the velocity in the middle of the stream, but that is not always the place um, along the width that has the highest average velocity. So that could have skewed our data. And then also, so we did not measure our data in the same locations that the group in 2014 did. So that could have skewed our data in comparison. Um, we also, like I mentioned earlier, took uh, 20 data points in 2021 and in 2014, they took 30 data points. Um, so they had a larger data spread. And then like Reagan mentioned earlier, our vegeta the vegetation in 2021 has grown uh, severely since 2011 when they put input the restoration. So that severely impacted uh, the accessibility of the stream. Our data had a lower average stream velocity than the 2014 data points. This is a positive indication of optimal spawning habitat for coho and uh, steelhead trout. The variety in stream classification is also a positive indication of high oxygenation levels that allow uh, biodiversity and other organisms to thrive. This also provides food for the salmon and the trout. Um, the heavy vegetation and variable pebble sizes are also important in providing variable habitat for different species and organisms within the stream. And then the shade uh, along the stream was very heavy and is important for especially heat sensitive species like salmon that have a very tight range of uh, heat sensitivity. For example, the salmon, uh, sockeye salmon didn't make it last year on the Columbia River run due to heat sensitivity during the heat wave. Um, and then from a holistic point of view, the restoration was successful. Not only did it provide positive rearing and spawning habitat for the fish, it also provided uh, many different habitats for other organisms to thrive. And just to kind of add on to that, it's just important to remember that our data is not a holistic view of Reeser Creek. It's just a snapshot that we took in October of 2021. It cannot accurately display the standard behavior of the creek throughout the year, even throughout the season. However, we really hope that our research can be used as an example of how stream restorations can be successful in other levied streams. 
And we hope that counties and states um, can look at this and see it as a reason to pursue future stream restorations. Thank you. Thank you so much. What questions do we have for the presenters? Uh, thank you. So you mentioned that this wasn't an, an ideal situation to, to fully monitor um, the restoration or the stream flows. Um, what do you think would be an ideal approach to really truly get a gauge of the stream flows in Reeser Creek? Um, well, I think it's obviously always better if we could have gotten more data points. We also collected our points like right after a lot of rain. Um, so that probably skewed our results. And then I think just going back on multiple days throughout the season and maybe going back in the spring could have been a way for us to examine and get a more um, thorough view of how the stream behaves in terms of velocity. How do you think the data would look over the different seasons? That's a good question. I think with the spring watershed, we'd see an influx of water, which would increase the velocity. I think too, uh, when we see plants begin to bloom and germinate and eventually grow, that'll slow down the velocity at the same time. So I think there's a lot of push and pull factors to the seasons. Other questions? It sounded like you divided roles when you collected data in the field. How did you, how did you decide who would do what job when you collected your data? <laughs> oh boy. Um, well, Lucy and I are both seniors, so we kind of designated Reagan, who's a junior, as the grunt girl, um, someone to put on the waders and get in the stream. Um, we did end up kind of bushwhacking all three of us. So it was mainly a group effort, but props to Reagan for actually getting in the water and getting her socks a little wet. Um, but yeah, it was kind of a group effort, so. Reagan, do you need to comment on that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Other questions? Okay. Well, if there are no other questions, round of applause. And let's get one more round of applause for the entire group because these were wonderful, wonderful. I learned so much today about Reeser Creek that I did not know before. Hopefully you did as well. That concludes the section of presentations about Reeser Creek today. Yeah, thank you.